Hey y'all, it's me, the hilarious Bus Matthews. And welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today we'll be covering a bit of international drag news, drag drama, and reviewing episode six of RuPaul's Drag Race UK versus the World Series 2. Our remaining six internationally acclaimed superstars were split into duos and challenged to learn a dance routine in the style of Strictly Come Dancing while wearing half mask, half femme drag. And the runway category was business in the front, party in the back. I came prepared. Everybody say hi to the baby. She's recovering from her spay. And so she has this beautiful Victorian collar on, which she hates by the way, but it's a necessary evil. Anyways, we'll be going pair by pair to break all of that down. But first some breaking drag news. RuPaul has retired from RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under, which means after three seasons as main host, she will not be returning for the newly announced fourth season, which was all officially announced in a post from Michelle Visage, the new host of the show, where she wrote, Drag Race Down Under is back with a new host, me. Premiering on Stan in Australia and WoW Presents Plus for the first time in New Zealand, season four also sees a star-studded lineup of Down Under's glittering drag royalty step up as judges and mentors alongside returning judge Reese Nicholson. Thank you, my dear RuPaul, for entrusting me with one of your beloved shows. The color, humor, and outrageousness of Down Under Drag holds a special place in my heart. I'm ready to do everything in my power to encourage these beautiful queens to believe in themselves and let their inner light shine through. Where she also included a quote from RuPaul saying, It has been my great honor to bring Drag Race to Australasia. I can't wait to see the franchise continue to flourish under the leadership of the incredible Michelle Visage. And while this is the first time we're seeing RuPaul's step back from a show she previously hosted under her own franchise umbrella. I can't say I'm totally surprised. I mean, Rue is still hosting the main US season, US, UK, UK versus the world, and is rumored to be hosting the new international all-star spinoff. Mother has got a lot on her plate. And as Jojo wrote in the comment section of Michelle Visage's announcement post, I can't really think of anyone more qualified to take over as host for Down Under. I mean, Michelle has been there for the past three years and has sat right next to RuPaul in every other season where they've hosted together. I do hope though that one of the recurring guest judges is always or almost always a drag queen. They got plenty of talent to pull from in the Down Under franchise already, plus queens like Courtney Act, who I guess if she wanted to come back, maybe could now that RuPaul won't be sitting on the panel. But now to the drama from this week, where we saw Roxy Andrews from season five and All Stars 2 have a little mini, very short-lived feud with Megami from season 16. And this all began on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, on March 13th when a user uploaded part of of one of Megami's drag performances to the platform. In the caption, they wrote, Megami, you're going to jail for this with the crying emoji. And in that clip segment, we see Megami do a spoken word quote of the bus stop moment from Roxy Andrews back on season five. And this came to Roxy Andrews' attention when another X user reposted this post writing, bite back please, LMAO, at Roxy Andrews. And Roxy Andrews responded to this clip writing, not time for foolishness, sad and disrespectful to add something like that in for laughs. Why not just be funny? To which Megami responds in a series of replies writing, before it all gets too crazy, this was a mix I made forever ago, doing Whitney so emotional with a bunch of dialogue clips of emotional drag race moments, more quoting famous moments from the show for the audience. But regardless of my intent, I clearly overstepped a boundary and used a moment that I shouldn't have and I will absolutely take it out of the mix. And especially being on the other side, I understand how things like this affect us all a lot more clearly. You're literally iconic and I wasn't trying to make fun of you. I will always own up to being wrong and I was here and I legitimately apologize for that. Adding also at the end of the day, yes, people have made these jokes before, but once someone acknowledges how a joke made them feel, the only thing I can do is apologize and change. When you know better, you do better. And now I know. And the next day, Roxy Andrew responds to Megami's apology saying, thank you. And I completely accept your apology. There are way too talents to need to use that. Keep turning it. Thank you for understanding understanding, much respect. A rare happy ending for a feud that began on the X platform, but we love to see it. And now let's hop on over to the UK, just for one day. <laughs> Starting with the order in which they performed their dance numbers, we have Hannah and Marina doing the Samba. And leading up to their challenge performance, we actually get a confessional from Marina Summers where she says, they've seen me performing and lip syncing, but dancing is where I feel most comfortable and powerful, which had me immediately gagged, shaking in my boots. I'm like, if she thinks her raw dancing ability is better than like her lip sync powers, then I can't wait to see this. And she was not being modest 
of it all. She absolutely 1000% killed this choreography. She has to be one of the best performers we have ever had on the RuPaul's Drag Race franchise across all the seasons. She is electrifying on this stage and comes off as a professional dancer who does this seven days a week. Even the guest judge, Mabusi, my Boosie, was saying she wouldn't be surprised if Marina got a call from the Strictly Come Dancing people to come be on the show. She killed it and this was totally hot. And Anaconda, as we know, isn't necessarily the best dancer, but she is a really good performer and the judges say she did a good job keeping up with Marina, which I agree with. Hannah brought lots of whimsy and charisma to this and, you know, no one, as we're learning, truly can keep up with Marina Summers on that stage, but yes, Hannah did a good job and I'd give her a hot two. And over on the runway, Marina Summers was very much giving me like a Miranda Presley and Devil Wears Prada kind of vibe in this really beautiful power executive realness suit. I love that slicked platinum hair and that big giant shoulder silhouette moment. She absolutely nails the business part of this brief while still keeping it in that realm of fashion. And then she turns around to, I think one of the best executions of the word party on this runway tonight. She has an entire karaoke set up on her backside. Literally a screen is sewn on to her back with some lyrics from one of RuPaul's songs playing. It just got all these buttons on her little bustle moments where, you know, you could choose a song to play next for the karaoke. This is incredible. This is funny. This is fashion. This is drag. And once again, Marina is just proving like she can do it all. This look is hot. And Hannah Connor hits the runway in a shiny gold suit with black details on the lapel and pants and has her face painted like a cat's, which she says is a reference to Top Cat, which was an animated American sitcom from the 60s, which according to Wikipedia also gained a lot of popularity over in the UK and Latin America. The more you meow. And this look is cute. Like, I do enjoy the reference here and the fact that she is very much giving me a Creepy Cats musical reference too. And this gold lame or vinyl, whatever the material is, is cute and flashy and does an okay job of meeting that business and party combination brief. But something about the fit and the jacket and the pants is just kind of off to me. And I don't love her interpretation of party on the back where she has all these little rats glued to plates and doilies with phrases like gay rats now and cheese is loves you and exterminator, hardly know her, which all are very funny once you can actually stop and read them. But the execution in terms of placement and craftsmanship of these doilies and toy rats, I don't think was the best. It felt a little arts and craftsy, as did the top hat with little ears glued on top. I think she just needed a little more finesse and polish in this look to really bring it to the finish line. So in terms of fashion, I think I smell a rat. Next up, we got Scarlet Envy and Teresa May dancing to the tango, because it takes two to tango. And it's pretty clear immediately when these two get going, Scarlet is the better dancer of the pair. She absolutely shines and truly outshines Shoditsa in this throughout the entire performance. And I love the drama and the facial movements and expressions that Scarlet was able to bring to this number when she would look and look and look. And generally speaking, she's got a lot more gusto and flair in all of her dance moves. Considered individually, I'd give Scarlet for this performance a hot. Shoditsa though would get a rot. She was just a little stiff here and felt behind on the moves. Like we could see Scarlet leading her into the next steps. And Trudica, instead of changing her facial expressions throughout the performance to match the tempo and pacing of what was going on, she kind of kept this same crazy look on her face throughout the entire thing, which was funny as the judges point out, but I'm not sure it made a lot of sense. And her dancing overall was rough and probably the weakest of everyone on the stage tonight. To be fair though, I want to acknowledge these queens did a lot with what they were actually asked to do because they weren't just asked to learn choreo, they were asked to learn a very specific style of dance. And considering that, everyone was impressive. Especially considering contestants on dance shows like Strictly Come Dancing actually rehearse for a minimum of 12 hours per two minute dance number and often have multiple 12 hours days just to get those two minute dance numbers right. And over on the runway, let's start with Scarlet Envy, who is wearing a beautiful homage to the outfit Barbra Streisand wore to accept her 1969 Best Actress Oscar in, which was, by the way, for her performance in Funny Girl. And I'm just gonna say Scarlet and her team have done an excellent job in the recreation of this look. It is so beautifully well done, and I think dragged up in appropriate ways, like with bigger pant flares. Plus, I love the detail of the word drama being written on the little Oscar prop she's carrying. And the party in the back part of the brief she has managed to accomplish in this look by basically cutting out the entire backside. And while this does feel obvious for what you might think of when you hear business in the front, party in the back, I do want to point out it's a little more ironic than it may seem at first, because Barbara Streisand 
actually is infamously horrified by this gown to this day because she apparently wasn't aware of how see-through the material was. And so there is a bit of tongue-in-cheek humor happening here with Scarlett making this scandalous outfit a little more scandalous actually scandalous. As usual, Scarlett brought the heat to the runway. This look is hot. And Sharitza May also attempts to bring a little heat to the runway, giving a very clear homage and reference to her infier no number that she opened this season with. Mixed with some 60s Valley of the Dolls stuff happening with this baby doll gown and giant poofed up coiffed hair. And it seems to hit this business part of the brief. She's carrying a pink briefcase, which <gasps> opens up at the end of the runway to reveal all of her secrets. Pink panties and other other unmentionables. Literally unmentionables on this channel because of monetization reasons. But I wasn't totally sold on the idea of the front part of this look being businessy. I guess there could be an argument though for this maybe being like an Avon door-to-door -door saleswoman girl type of thing happening. And the party part of this look we see when she turns around is there is a chunk of this baby doll dress missing in the back and she's got a devil's tail coming out of her backside. And overall, I like Charitza tapped into this flames devil inferno reference that she's brought into this season now a couple times. However, I do wish she had pushed it a little bit further. It just felt the execution here was a little weak and weaker than some of the devil or flame references in outfits we've already seen from her. And so so I think for her to continue to make references to this idea of devil drag, she would need to keep pushing the envelope. So I'm gonna give this a and lastly, we've got two of the tallest queens to ever grace the stage of RuPaul's Drag Race paired up together to perform the quick step. It's Tia Coffee and the Grand Dame. And considered as a duo, these two to me were the weakest in terms of nailing the choreography. I felt like there was a noticeable awkwardness in the way they were dancing. It felt like they were still at the trying to understand the dance moves and not fully grasping the emotion or actual style of dance beyond the steps. And there were several moments where these two weren't in sync or seemed to be missing some of the steps. Despite that most of their actual dance was just those two staring into each other's eyes and jumping up and down. <laughs> For all my criticism on their dancing though, that doesn't mean I don't think they weren't entertaining. They both brought a lot of charisma to this number and they were absolutely playing up the camp factor with their facial expressions and they had a little fun moment at the end of their dance where they had a surprise kiss. Which is to say the performance aspect of what they were doing was good, but the dancing to me felt like a rock. And over the runway, Tia Coffee is referencing St. Sebastian, who she and Alan Carr both call a gay icon. And I didn't even know who this was, much less know that he was considered a gay icon. But as per Wikipedia, according to traditional belief, St. Sebastian was killed during the Dio Clichy Clichianic persecution of Christians. He was initially tied to a post or tree and shot with arrows, though this did not kill him. He was, according to tradition, rescued and healed by Irene of Rome, which became a popular subject in 17th century painting. In all versions of the story, shortly after his recovery, he went to Diocletian to warn him about his sins and as a result was clubbed to death. <laughs> they have some really crazy stories in the Bible. <laughs> Anyways, as for the gay icon part, he's shirtless and has abs, so sure, I guess he fits the bill. Tia's interpretation of this gay icon is absolutely beautiful. This has to be one of the best runways she has brought to this competition. And I just absolutely love all those brown and gold tones she has incorporated throughout this gown. And the ruffles on the shoulders are so beautiful. I also love the halo detail on the head. And the party in the back element of this look she reveals is the arrows, which according to tradition had shot St. Sebastian. And the arrows in her back are just as beautiful as the dress is in the front and the red crystals coming down from those arrows are really well done. This is a very pretty and hot look, no doubt. But I was sitting there wondering, how does this really meet? Business in the front, party in the back? Because is a storm of arrows in your back like really a party? Not a party I would go to. Business in the front, dying in the back, uh. And the Grand Dame hits the runway in one of the most beautiful wedding gowns I think I've ever seen. And I don't just mean wedding gowns I've seen on RuPaul's Drag Race. I mean wedding gowns, period. This is so, so gorgeous. Elegant, beautiful, simple, sophisticated. And I thought she's put those crystals and butterflies in her wig. Big. This is just chef's kiss. Plus that split veil coming down to a train that she's carrying down the runway, she is the moment. However, kind of like her scene partner today, Miss Tia Coffee, the party in the back element of what's going on in her look maybe didn't make a ton of sense 
to me or for this brief in general. She turns around to reveal an entire arsenal of redstone weapons, which are not things I would want to be present at a party, but maybe Legrand Dom and I just go to very different parties. But also how interesting was it that her and Tia were partners in this challenge and also partners in interpreting this party in the back brief as being related to weapons. The Grand Dom does look gorgeous, so we're gonna give this look a hot, even if she was a little off brief. And our bottom two tonight are announced to Scarlet and Charitza, a decision I don't really agree with. I probably would have split the groups up and done Charitza and either Tia or Legrand Dom because Scarlet was, I thought, noticeably better than all three of those other queens in terms of dancing. And I also think there could have been an argument for having both Tia and Legrand Dom in the bottom considering, in my opinion, they were the weakest dancers as a pair. I think it's pretty clear though, based on the storytelling of this season and narrative of this in the past few episodes that Charitza's time time was basically coming to an end. And the producers probably wanted to guarantee a Chiritza elimination instead of doing something like, you know, putting Le Grand Dom or Tio, their front runners, into the bottom and risking an extremely controversial elimination. Our top two this week, I absolutely agree with. It was Hannah and Marina all the way. And I had to react to the best parts of this episode in this lip sync over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website and you can join to support the channel and catch tons of exclusive content like reaction videos to every episode of Drag Race I review by clicking the link in the description of this video. See you there. But in summary, this lip sync from Marina was a total slay. I cannot with her. She, as I said earlier, is one of the best performers this show, this franchise has ever seen. For real, for real, on God, no cap, all Riz. <laughs> Seriously though, like she can kill lip sync like no other queen. And Hannah did okay in this, sure. But even she, like there's moments where she's looking over at Marina perform this song and it's clear she's like, yeah, Marina's beating me. So I'm just gonna look and point at her. So Marina takes the win, rightly so, and secures her third win in this competition. Marina Summer's Drag Race, win. And the lipstick she reveals is Charitza Mays. And yes, I do absolutely agree that this was the correct decision here. Sending Scarlet home for that performance would have been a crime, especially considering Charitza was also in the bottom last week. And finally, as for my hottest <laughs> on the runway, this week I'm going to give it to Scarlet NB. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hot, and they've chosen Marina Summers. And I want to give an extra special shout out to Ashley Brungard, Child Free Mateau, Dorothy Hall, Felicia, Laura, Matthew Burns, Steven Topher, <laughs> and Will and Tana, who are all supporting me at my Bussy Queen collector tier at patreon.com slash Queen. Love ya. Bye.